Hello, so the last video I had, I talked about outliers and how they can influence our analyses and some restrictions. And I mentioned that the nonparametric permutation test was not a magical fix for outliers. And I said I would come back and explain why that is the case. This is it. Um, specifically, uh, the issue I'm gonna focus on is the bivariate outlier. And what I mean by that, whoopsie, is that the, oh, mouse failure. Uh, so we have a continuous covariate in our model. So this would uh, reflect a, a group level regression with a continuous covariate. And you have a subject or multiple subjects that have outlying values both in their covariate x, their explanatory variable, and in the explained variable y. So as you know, in this case, regression slopes are easily influenced by outliers. It's easy to pull the regression slope up. Um, in this case, the data are null, but if I fit a regression line through here, the, you know, the slope would likely be positive. So if you think about this, your goal would be that your null distribution would reflect this fact, the fact being that slopes, null slopes can be a little bit larger in magnitude than traditional null slopes would be if uh, there were no outliers. So to illustrate this, and just FYI, I'm re-recording the whole video because I thought about adding this in after the fact. So enjoy the slide. Um, what I've done here is I've estimated data, 10,000 data sets of null data, and I ran the linear regressions. And the two cases here would be no outliers in orange and the bivariate outlier in blue. So these are the null distributions, or the distributions of the T statistics. And they're wiggly just because I fit uh, a non-parametric non density uh, function through it. So the point I was making on the previous slide is that the slopes in magnitude under the null are going to be bigger than what you would expect if you didn't have outliers. And that is being reflected in the fact that the null under the bivariate outliers needs to be fatter than the null with no outliers. So the question is, when we permute our data in the nonparametric permutation test, we are those, is that weirdness, the, the, the bivariate outlier being preserved in order to ensure that our distribution is sort of fattened up like this. So um, this is the results that I showed in the last video. If you saw it, if you didn't, um, no big deal. I'll walk you through it. I realize there's a lot going on in the slide. The top row is the type one error rates. The bottom row is power. In this case, I should have just taken the bottom row off because uh, power is kind of uh, a non-story non in this case because the type one error rates never controlled. So these are simulated null data with bivariate outliers. The outliers are either driven by between subject variants on the left or within subject variants on the right. And then I looked at all these models that I'm not going to go into. Two types of robust regression, OLS and the permutation test are the same. This is what I want to focus on today. Kendall's tau, flame one with and without the outlier to weighting option, and just the silly idea of uh, chucking subjects who have a, a small Cook's D. So trying to automate the uh, outlier removal process. Flame one's gonna be king when the outlier is driven by the within subject variance because that's when it really excels. But the story of interest here is that OLS and the permutation test fail together equally badly. And this is an important thing to realize. So, you know, I tend to err on the side of thinking, well, non-parametric tests have a single assumption and they're gonna be better than the other tests. And it is true. Um, they can do really well, but that assumption still needs to hold. And this is illustrating that when it doesn't hold in terms of our type one error rates, you're going to do just as bad as the super simple OLS model. So what is this exchangeability assumption? And this, is, this was something that I could always, you know, repeat back the definition, which is when we permute our data, the underlying distributional properties remain unchanged. And I could wrap my head around the most commonly used example, time series that are temporally autocorrelated are not exchangeable because if you swap the data, the correlation goes away. Um, but generally, I have a hard, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Generally, I had a hard time 
you know, trying to look at a data set and say, okay, this is the, my data look like this. And then trying to figure out, well, does exchangeability hold for these data? I don't know. So what first I need to explain what I mean by exchangeability. So the way the permutation test works, if you don't already know, and I do have videos for that. So just search my um, YouTube channel for the permutation tests videos, but you have your original data. So I'm effectively running a regression where uh, X is the explanatory variable and Y is the explained variable. For the permutation test, the permutation refers to permuting the Y's. So they're all still here. I didn't lose any of them. It's a resampling without replacement. And then you run your test, save the T statistic, permute again, get the T statistic, et cetera, et cetera. And you use that to build your null distribution. So when exchangeability, I said uh, commonly the example given is that the if the data are temporarily autocorrelated. So going back to the unshuffled data, if the correlation between adjacent time points is always 0.2, and to keep life simple, let's say all other correlations are zero. So one and two are correlated at 0.2, one and three are at zero, and one and everything else is at zero. But so any two time points that are adjacent are correlated at 0.2. So that's the thing that we need to be preserved if we shuffle the data. But if I shuffle the data, now these two adjacent time points in my permuted data are actually going to have a correlation of zero. So I have violated exchangeability. It needs to remain 0.2. So effectively, you just can't do a permutation test here. Um, so I think this is a really easy example. It's easy to understand why exchangeability is failing to hold. Um, here I'm just showing exchangeability again. You have your data and I'm going to swap the y values of these two points, for example. Um, so that's what it looks like on the scatter plot. So going back to this bivariate outlier, well, what's the weird thing? We don't have temporal autocorrelation, but we do have something weird about the data. So I've re- uh, maybe I don't know if I said this already, but I've I've sort of redefined this exchangeability thing for myself. Where I think is there anything weird about my data, and does that weird thing hang out if I permute the data? So the weird thing here is, of course, this influential outlier can pull the regression line up. But as you can see with a permutation, as soon as that outlier is put in the middle of the data or near the middle of the data for the x value, which will happen on most of the permutations it's no longer an influential outlier. An outlier, yes, it's an outlier in Y, but it's not an outlier in X. So the worst it could do is maybe pull up the, pull the uh, intercept a little bit, but um, probably not enough to inflate type one error rate. I would be really surprised if it, it impacted that at all. So unfortunately, what's going to happen is we need that weird thing to fatten up our null distribution, but our null distribution will not be fat enough. It's going to be too skinny. And if your null distribution is too skinny, your p-values are going to be too small. So that's exactly why the type 1 error was inflated in the simulations I showed earlier, because the null was too skinny. So the takeaway from this, I, I'm definitely... Um, not anti-permutation tests. They're great, but you need to make sure this exchangeability assumption holds. And in the case of heteroscedasticity, uh, it may not hold. Um, this bivariate outlier is an example. And when it doesn't hold, you basically get what you would get if you just use OLS. So it's not giving you much on top of ordinary least squares with a standard uh, uh, t-statistic. Of course, the simulations I ran were not corrected for multiple comparisons. It was a one voxel thing. So this isn't really getting into the uh, controlling of multiple comparisons. Uh, this is separate from that. So hopefully that's clear. So you can have inflated type 1 error from poor multiple comparison control, but you can also have it when your, header, your exchangeability assumption fails to hold. So I hope that clears some things up and gives you some insight, some new insight about when permutation tests can fail so that you can look for these things in your own data. And just to reiterate what I said in the last video, we're never ever 
going to find a magical model that fits all the problems of, in our data such that we can confidently run it whole brain and not inspect the data at all. We have to look at our data more and look for these things like outliers and um, other forms of heteroscedasticity that might be present in the data. So, okay, with that, I'll say please join the Facebook group or follow me on Tumblr or Twitter or all three, and I hope you have a really good day.